Vicky asked me, he's going to have this event today, and would I sort of uh, come and talk to you? So I said, okay. Uh, then I went home and I said, what do I talk to a bunch of 20-year-olds? 75-year-old me, I got 15 grandchildren, two of them are there. <laughs> so I said, why don't I talk to you about the five L's, the three Q's and the two H's? It's a mnemonic that you can quite easily memorize. Okay, uh, all the pictures that you're going to see were shot by me, personally. Okay, what does the five L's stand for? Five L is say. Uh, L, the first L is for leaders, yeah, uh, and for leadership, okay, that's a whale, <laughs> and legacy, and then life, and then living, okay, those are the five L's. I'm going to tell you one by one what they are and what they stand for and what and how it applies to you, okay. Um, I have the benefit of hindsight. You are 20 year olds on the threshold of becoming adults. I have 2020 rear view vision, so I've seen the back. It's very clear. And you're going to face life. Uh, you're going to face what I've seen the last 50 years. I'll just give you a bit of uh, helping hand there. And uh, in this talk, I will try and tell you what to expect. First of all, about leadership. Leadership and leaders. Uh, you need to be aware that uh, leadership, actually, only one-third of leaders are born. Two-thirds learn to become leaders. So, in other words, leadership can be learned. And how do you learn leadership? The most powerful lessons of them all is actually from experience, from, from looking at what other leaders are doing. Okay? So the first thing that you must learn is how not to be a bad leader. Uh, today in court, uh, this past uh, few weeks, we have seen our previous leaders being charged with all sorts of crimes against uh, the country, uh, stealing, uh, cheating, you know, low morals. So if you ask me, what is leadership? The bedrock of leadership are four items. Yeah. Uh, First of all, the honor, you must have honor to become a leader. You must have honesty, you must be honest, yeah? And you must have integrity, and you, have, you must have morality. Morality is the, 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 the thing in you that wants to be good, huh? that uh, you know that something's crooked, you go straight. So the bedrock of leadership, and you're going to be a future leaders of this country, these are the four qualities that you must always have in you. If you don't have this, you cannot be a leader, okay? So learn from what the bad leaders are doing. Don't do that, okay? Then, what is that other quality of a leader that you must have before you can become a leader? It's vision. Vision is the ability to see a state in the future, uh, a position in the future, and then getting there. When, uh, when uh, Mate was the minister, a prime minister the first time around. He had a vision for Malaysia to be a developed country in the year 2020. That's next year. But somewhere along the way, some bad leaders came along and ruined all that. So he had a vision, he says, that by 2020, we're going to be a developed nation. What did he try to do? He said, OK, let's have a national car. Everybody laughs at a national car. But the idea was good. He was trying to start a national car so that there are supporting industries that can then become the multiplier effect for the, multiply, for the national car. The national car by itself is not the, the, the intent. The intent was to actually create the national car and the supporting industries would then bring us into the 20th century. Okay? So a leader must have vision. So if you want to be a leader, a uh, leader of your country, a leader of your company, a leader of your family. You must have a vision where you want to take the group that you're leading to, okay? So you must have a vision, and not only a vision, a leader is an agent of change, yeah? They make change happen. And how do you make change happen? You have to be able to actually build a team to take you there. You can't do this yourself, okay? 
you have to have a team. And if you have a team, what must you do? You must be able to communicate to the team what your ideals is, where you want to take them. You must be able to motivate and inspire your team yeah, by, by, by being uh, you know, a, a, a leader who can, be, you know, who, can be, who you can be proud to be a leader of. Yeah? So leaders lead and inspire teams to achieve goals. So this is your aim if you want to be a leader, okay? This is what you must do, yeah? Followers, just follow the leader. The leader must be able to build a team, inspire everybody else, and he must have communication skills to tell people what he's trying to do, and then take them there, okay? You are the leaders of tomorrow, yeah? What is the vision? What is the vision that you have for, for this country, for the teams that you're going to lead, yeah? Uh, how are you going to be an agent of change to change this country from what it is today to what it's going to be during your time, okay? Legacy, the second L. What is the legacy you're going to leave behind, okay? Many years ago, 50 years ago when I was like you, 20-year-old, just finished university in 1968, I think, it was 69, long time ago, can't remember. So uh, we inherited from the generation before me, uh, my... my uh, grandfather, my father, and all that, they gave us a, a, um, a, a Malaysia, which was actually an agricultural uh, country. You know, we were very backward in the sense that we were just farmers and producing um, paddy and planting rubber and mining tin and all that. But uh, what we did was, in that last 50 years that they've given us this country, we did many things, okay? So we inherited a legacy from the generations before us. The question I ask you is that when you come and stand here in front of this group of 20-year-olds and you've done your part 50 years from today, what is the legacy you're going to leave behind? Okay? Let me just tell you what was the legacy that the generation before me gave us. Okay? Uh, for a start, uh, the positive legacies, okay? the ones which, are, which we, are, we are proud of. Okay? We gave you independence from a country that was just a colony of Great Britain. We gave you independence, okay? Uh, Tengku Abdul Rahman, I remember I was there in the, in the stadium, 12-year-old, 11-year-old, listening to Tunku shouting, Ordeka, and all that, you see? So we gave you independence, okay? And then what did we do? We converted the country from just being a rubber-producing country, a tin-producing country, when Rubber and tin prices went down the tubes, tin because it was replaced by plastics. We gave you the palm oil industry, yeah? Tun Razak, father of the present or the past prime minister, started Felda, uh, planting oil palm. Then we gave you the oil and gas industry. I was working in the oil and gas industry for three years, yeah? Uh, Petronas is one of the most successful multinational Malaysian bread. Okay, and then we gave you the digital revolution. Everyone, you've got this phone in your in your pocket, uh, your TV, you know the uh, the internet and all that. Yeah, and then we gave you a higher standard of living. When I was a twenty-year-old like you, the gross national product of Malaysia was only three point six billion. We have increased it by a hundred times to three hundred and sixty billion. So when you stand here. 50 years from today, how many times is that going to be increased? Okay? That's a challenge. How, how, are you going to, how are you going to do that? Yeah? So anyway, there are also some negatives. I'm not saying that all are roses. We left you things like pollution. We were in the Arctic and we saw, and we saw plastic bottles, you know, nets. A thousand kilometers from civilization, you know, we saw fishing nets. We saw we saw this uh, polystyrene boxes here. Yeah? Remember? So environmental destruction. We saw uh, we saw uh, uh, global warm warming. The effects of global warming. Polar bears were becoming thinner and thinner because the ice was melting. Polar bears feed on the ice. So when there is no ice, they can't hunt. If they can't hunt, then they go hungry and become thinner. We also are leaving you a country that is divided. 
there is distrust between the races, okay? Uh, the Malay doesn't trust the Chinese, the Chinese doesn't trust the Malay. We are giving you a country that has religious intolerance, you know? Um, we are leaving you a country uh, with an education system that many people are saying has been broken, that you people are all being educated in silos. When I was in the Royal Military College, everybody were my brothers, you know? Um, some of my non-Malay friends even faster and got up for sahur at night just because we were together and nobody was thinking that you're a Malay, you're a Chinese, you're an Indian. So our education system has been broken. Yeah? I will not say why I think it is broken, but it is broken. How are you going to fix it? This is your country. This is your problem. Yeah? So these are some of the uh, uh, negatives that we are leaving you the widening gap between rich and poor, the uh, rising cost of living, inflation, you know, these are some of the negatives. We are also, of course, leaving you a distinction of being the world's biggest kleptocracy, yeah? I'm not proud of it, but uh, this is what I'm leaving you. So it's up to you to change this, yeah? Uh, the start is, of course, what Zubedi uh, mentioned, that you yourself must be honest, you must have integrity, you must have honesty, yeah? the uh, moral uh, high ground, um, walking the straight and narrow. So in short, my generation is leaving you a almost broken Malaysia. You've got to fix it. You've got to fix it. I don't know how you're going to do it, but that's your problem. <laughs> it's, it's not a joke. It is. You know? Okay, so your challenge then, your legacy, uh, the legacy that you are inheriting from my generation, uh, what is the legacy you're going to leave behind 50 years from today when you are here, sitting in front of a group of 20-year-olds, listening to your, to your speech? And um, the question is, how do you heal a nearly broken Malaysia? What is your vision for your country? Yeah, as Vidya has told you about unity, about how you, you try to find unity in diversity, uh, how you uh, celebrate each other's uh, festivities using the music or the songs of a uh, different race. How are you going to realize that vision? Just think about it. Because you guys are going to make it happen. If you don't, we'll go further down the tubes. Okay? The question again, what is the legacy you're going to leave behind to those that come after you? I want now to talk to you about life and living. So I've talked to you about the three L's, uh, leaders, leadership, and legacy. The other two L's, uh, my pet subject, uh, about life and living. The uh, average lifespan of a Malaysian male is actually 76. Don't look at Mate as 93. Because Mahathir is 93 and the average is 76 is because the Tanjong PI MP died at 43. <laughs> okay? So I'm 75, you know? The average lifespan of a Malaysian male is 76. So I technically have only one year left to live. Okay? So if you say that you're born and 76 years later you die, what are the phases of life that you go through? Okay? You go through a childhood. A childhood is when you are totally dependent on your, on your parents, you know. They have to feed you, they have to clothe you. When you pee, they got to change you, yeah. You have gone through that stage. And then you go through the changes, the hormonal changes of puberty. You know, between 12 to 15, uh, you start thinking, you know, you start thinking of this thing called self. You know, you start discovering that there is an inner self and there is an outer world, you know. There is a, there is a conflict between what you want inside and what the world wants you or, or can give you, okay? So you go through the changes of puberty, your first changes of, uh, of hormonal changes in, uh, during puberty, and then you proceed on to get an education. So the average, uh, the average span at which you get a degree is about 23 years, okay? After that, you get a job. You graduate, you get a job. Then you work until you are 65. Normally, people retire at 65, okay? And then you have about 11 years of retirement. 30% uh, of your life, 23 divided by 
75, 76 is about 30%, is spent getting educated. Okay? And then you spend another 42 years of your life, 55% of your life working, yeah? getting, uh, making a living, uh, bringing up your children or whatever. And then 11 years later, you die. <laughs> okay? So those are the phases of your life. Huh? 30% getting an education, 55% um, uh, working, earning money, the rat race, you know, conniving, cheating, you know, uh, stealing even, you know. And after that, you die. There are many people, you know, many people who are professionals, uh, doctors, lawyers, you know, um, businessmen, they don't know how to retire. PK is nearly my age, he's still working. So be careful, you know, when you, when you start working, that you do not work until the day that before you die, you're still working. Because on average, you will die at, uh, at 76. So if you work until the day you die, you would be spending 70% of your life working. For what? Yeah. So spare thought for that. When you're working, you ought to be thinking about how can you, how can you earn enough, uh, make provision, so that by the time you decide to retire and enjoy life a little bit, you have some form of sport, you know? Uh, in other words, start building an investment portfolio. Start saving, because saving is postponing consumption. If you don't save, you spend everything that you earn, you'll never get anywhere, okay? Me, I retired at 53. When my youngest daughter graduated, I said, that's it. I want to retire. So technically, I would be spending about 30% of my life in retirement. Next year, I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah, 76, huh? I'm 75. So technically, I should die. But I don't think so. <laughs> because my, all my mother, my father, my, my brothers, my sisters, they're all dead, but they died at way beyond 85. I have one more, child, one more sister who is 90, oh, 90 years this, this, uh, this year. So I don't expect to die yet. So maybe I'll die at 85. Yeah? If I die at 85, look at the proportion of my working life compared to my retirement life. For the last 20 years, I've driven to all the continents of the world. I've driven to 135 countries. Yeah? And uh, part of the adventures that I went to, I went with PK you know, and a group of friends. Um, I'm here today. Um, in five days' time, I'm returning to Antarctica. Yeah? So uh, life has been fine. You know? So... Live life, you know. Don't don't just work and earn money and then, uh, and then uh, you know, and then uh, leave your money to your to your children or your, your your widow. You know, that's why the world's richest people are the widows of foolish men. The world's richest people are rich widows of foolish men. Okay, so um, think about that. You know, when you start working, uh, start thinking that and start remembering that the average lifespan of a Malaysian male is only 76, okay? So if you say that you're gonna die at 76, I want to tell you now that life comprises of a few stages and each stage has got characteristics that you should be aware of so that when you come to that, that, that point in your life, you can expect it, you know, and then you can anticipate and then maybe prepare for it. So in your adolescence, what are the characteristics? In your adolescence, you are in the brainwashing part of life. You know, your parents, society, your teachers, uh, everybody around you are trying to brainwash you. They're giving you, you know, things like uh, their values, you know, their values, uh, their beliefs, uh, their morals, uh, their religion, uh, their sense of what is right or wrong, what is uh, society, society's sense of right or wrong. They're trying to brainwash you because when you are born, your, your mind is empty, you know. So you're being trained to become a self-regulating adult. By now, when you're about 19 or 20, you're supposed to be almost able to self-regulate yourself. But then, inside you is this struggle, the struggle of uh, your inner self against the rules and regulations of society. Yeah? If your parents, your teachers, and your, and your religious uh, priests and all that, have given you a good uh, uh, brainwashing, 
you would know how to control your inner self against all these demands from the outside or all these restrictions from outside. So in your adolescence, the thing that uh, is common in your, in your life is that you need permission to do anything, right? You want to come out 12 o'clock at night, ask mommy for permission, you know? Mommy says yes, daddy says no, usually. You're being programmed what, what is right and what is wrong, you know? And uh, if you are properly uh, brainwashed, you leave home and enter your 20s and get a job, and then you come into what I call the trying 20s. Because now suddenly, there is no more control, you know? You've got a job, you earn your own money, you've got your own pet, your own, your own place to, to stay, you can come back at any, any time, three o'clock, two o'clock. You can stay overnight, nobody's gonna say anything. Uh, at 22, 23, when you get a job, there are no more controls, you know? That is when the brainwashing that your parents has done for you takes effect. You are now a self-regulating adult. So in your 20s, what you are going to do now? You're going to leave. You're going to be trying out all the different uniforms of life. You know, you will be trying to find people who think like you, friends who you can get along with. You're trying to find a life partner that you can spend your entire life with. Yeah? Um, some of you may go overboard. You go for body piercings, you know, you put a, a ring around your, your thing here. And then I've, I've known some of my nieces who shave their head bald. Nieces, not, not, not nephews, eh? shaving the head bald. This is, uh, you know, that stage of life where you are trying all sorts of things. And you meet somebody. Uh, for, for girls, you are trying to find somebody that replaces your daddy as your protector, you know, somebody whom you can look up to for, for, for help, for, for physical protection, right? So you try a lot of things. You, you get into a job, you know, and then you focus on your job. You might even get married, get children, you know? And then you come to your 30s. Your 30s, I call it the turbulent 30s. Now the decisions that you've been making, you know, uh, the job that you took, you thought it was a fantastic job, then suddenly you find, hey, I'm not happy here, lah. I ought to be promoted, but I'm not promoted, you know. I've been in this rat race, but I'm not winning, you know. So, so you, 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 you come to realize that some of the decisions you made in your 20s are coming back to haunt you. And the, the, the man or the woman that you married uh, may not be suitable. Some of you change jobs. Uh, you then come to the realization that you're not all that hot shot after all. You thought that you can conquer the world, you're going to be a millionaire by 30, many people say, you know. But then you begin to realize that life is quite different. You know? It depends on how, well, how good you are at, at, at living, how clever you are, and how resilient you are in the face of uh, challenges. So some of you may face a death, you know, one of your parents may die, you know. So you start feeling a loss, you know. Uh, many will begin to feel the seven-year itch. After being married for seven years, you know, then the other girl suddenly looks extra nice or, you know, whatever, you know. And then some of you will go through divorce. There are people who've got children and get divorced by 35, yeah? So these are possibilities. Just be aware of it, you know, because after seven years with the same person, you know, you begin to have, uh, what do you call it, wild eyes. And some of you may become single parents, you know, and uh, you have kids who go to school, yeah. You, some of you resign yourself to, you know, to looking after your kids, you know, whatever your, your partner, life partner is, you know, you try to, uh, uh, you know, adapt and, uh, and, and live with it. Um, many of you will feel a financial squeeze, you know, you have to pay for the mortgage for the house, you have to pay for the, uh, you know, for the... Uh, higher service, uh, higher purchase payment for your car. Uh, and one of the biggest expenditures that you will find will be paying for the education of your children. Yeah? So these are the issues that you'll be facing in your 30s and leading up to your 40s. I call it the fall on 40s, you know. When you are in your 40s, you then uh, uh, resign yourself, you know, that uh, this is my life, you know. I, I might as well adapt, you know, and, and then try to make the best of it, you know. And some of you in your 40s might even face retrenchment because uh, 
I know a lot of people, uh, Zubiri will know too, because of the change in the economic environment in the 90s, for example, you know, uh, they restructured, so they had to uh, redesign their organization and do things with less people, for example. So resources have got to be, or human resources have got to, to be reallocated. So you might be a victim of uh, corporate retrenchment. So these are some of the uh, changes that you, you, you get, you, you get to, to experience. Yeah? And women, for example, you know, as you go into your late 40s, the second phase of your hormonal changes uh, sets upon you. Uh, what are the hormonal changes I'm talking about? You know, menopause, for example. Uh, women become crazy and suddenly they, you know. Uh, but men also have got menopause. You know, as the level of testosterone reduces, uh, they then look for ways in which they can reassure themselves that I'm still good looking, I can still pull in the birds, you know. So yeah, some of them go and get, uh, you know, um, some young ladies as, uh, you know, your companions or, you know, and many young ladies become sugar, da find sugar daddies, you know. So in your 40s, this kind of thing happens. Huh? And for men who are about 40, 45, uh, they have this kind of uh, uh, drive, you know, so you have to understand, right? Um, women, of course, uh, some, some of you may start working and then suddenly you get married, you have children, and you decide to give up all your career because you want to raise your children. Be careful, because if you do that, this um, change in life when you're in your 40s is going to become even more severe because uh, once your kids reach 23 and they leave home like you're going to leave home, your mummy and your, your especially your mothers, are going to hit, get hit with this empty nest syndrome. You know, once we had children running around, now there's nobody there. So you start picking on the husband. So these are some of the changes that happens in the, in the 40s. You know? But many of us accept our limitations. Uh, we, uh, we try to handle with it as best as we can. That's why we call it the fall-on 40s. You know, I mean, this is life, you know. It is what I am. You know, I cannot be a millionaire by 30. I'm only getting this much. So, you know, I learned to, to live with it and to be happy with it. Then you reach your 50s, um, what I call the the resigned 50s, or the, uh, the uh, refresh. Either you're resigned to it or you get refreshed. Uh, if you're man enough, you, if the job has not been good, I mean, leave. Leave and find something, do something new. I mean, for me, in my 50s, I've had enough of corporate life. You know, I've, I've gone where I've, I thought I should be. Let's try something else. So I decided to throw in the towels and I started to make photography my my passion, you know, and I go around the world, travel around the world, go and drive all over the place, shoot two million pictures, and some of which I'm sharing today. Uh, again, the 50s are, some people have got late menopause, you know. So you, you, you get this, uh, this hormonal changes again, and many of you, your bodies will get wrecked by diseases, cancer, you know, um, that kind of thing, you know. And uh, many people become born again Christians or born again Muslims, you know. They, they start to say, this is life, now it's all I can achieve, I should start preparing for my afterlife. You know, they start their proselytizing effort, make you more Muslim than they are. <laughs> so the emptiness uh, uh, relief, as I was saying to you, might um, um, show itself in the form of women looking for jobs at the time when they are 45, 50, you know, changing jobs and so on. Okay, um, the most important or most painful thing is the self-value crisis that you will feel between about 40 to 50, you know. Um, is this all that life is all about? I mean, why haven't I reached what I thought I would reach when I was 20, you know? In your 20, you want to become a millionaire by 30, you know? And then you re suddenly you, re you discover that it's a it ain't going to happen, you know? So if that is the case, then you this, uh, this crisis of, uh, of self-value. But when you become 60s, you, know, you become more or less resigned to all this. You, know, you become serene. And uh, when you become 70, you become like me, dispensing wisdom, you know? <laughs> whether it is, uh, it is relevant or it is, uh, people listen or not. But you know, you're, you're quite comfortable with your life. Um, in my, from my 50s, I started to change my view of life, 
uh, from working to spending my children's inheritance. Life is a series of, uh, of, of, of phases. Uh, each phase prepares you for the next phase of life. Yeah? Uh, you will find that as you reach your 30s, you're now in your 20s, um, things that happen in your 20s uh, or will influence what will be your life in your 30s. And what you do in your 30s will influence what will be your life in your 40s. So life is a series of passages, of phases, that each phase prepares you for the next one. And each phase, uh, whether you believe it or not, is quite common to a lot of people. You know? We all go through this. You are not unique. Yeah? You are not unique. These are quite common uh, changes that we go through. And all the time, all the time that this is happening, you will have this conflict between the inner self that you discovered when you were in your indolence uh, to, uh, you know, to now. And sometimes uh, this, uh, this thing in you fascinates, you know. There is a Smeagol in all of us, you know. Uh, you know Smeagol from Lord of the Rings? This has got a dual personality, yeah? There is one side of him that says, you know, uh, I want to do this, you know. And then there's another side of him, no, I cannot do this. Uh, I want to kill this fellow because I want to get back the ring or whatever, you know. And then this side say, no, I cannot do that. So this struggle between you and the outside world, between the regulations of the outside world, will always be there, yeah? You have to, you have to understand this. And once you accept this, and then you set the boundaries for yourself. You see, for, for human beings, huh, for, for us all, there are four dark traits dark traits in us. It's called the dark tetrad of personality traits. And the, uh, the, uh, the top of the list is narcissism. Narcissism is, uh, is ego, is uh, vanity, is all about yourself, you know. Um, look at children uh, when they do something. Look at me, look at me. It's the same with, uh, with adults too, you know. You're trying to get recognition, you know. You're trying to get recognition. So this is part of narcissism. A little bit of narcissism is good because if you don't have any feelings of ego, you will always be walking with, the, you know, I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm no good. You must start thinking that you are good, you, know, you are good. But don't go overboard, okay? So everybody has got that trait of narcissism in them, you know. This is one of the human uh, dark traits. And if you study psychology, uh, this is what it is. And then the second thing is psychopathy. Psychopathy is this, uh, this bad thing in us that wants to do harm to others. And that's why you've got people in the U.S. shooting children, you know. You've got, um, you've got this, uh, uh, this case of these two guys who took a pregnant cat and put it into a washing machine and turned on the washing machine, you know. Uh, this is psychopathy, you know. If you allow it to get beyond control, you become a menace to society, okay. Then there is this uh, thing called Machiavellism. If you read history, uh, Machiavelli wrote the book called The Prince. Uh, it was advice to his ruler, the prince was going to become the king, so Machiavelli was trying to school the prince into the, w the ways of being a ruler, you know. Uh, basically what it says under Machiavellism is that the end justifies the means. So the state says, uh, you are a drug addict, we condemn you to death. Why? Because we don't want drug addicts around the society. So the end justifies the means. Yeah? So in your case, in your case, your inner self say, I want to be rich, so it's okay to steal. But your other thing, your, you know, the balance in your life, your, 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 your being says, stealing is wrong. You know? So how can you control this thing? Okay? And then of course, the last part is sadism. Sadism manifests itself basically in, in many, many ways, but uh, the most common is in sexual, you know, sexual... Uh, uh, things, you know, uh, making people suffer for your own, uh, for your own uh, pleasure, okay? So, be aware that there are these four traits in you. Uh, they are there. Some of it is good, a little bit of it is good. But be aware and control it and don't let it rule your life, yeah? Our friend, uh, the ex-Prime Minister, wanted to be rich. He wanted to be all-powerful, so he thought, Stealing 10 billion from the country is okay because it justifies his, his, his end. You know? uh, then the three cues. The three cues are nothing more than the quest for money, the quest for wealth, the quest for happiness, 
and the quest for tranquility. But the fact is, don't forget that if you make money, you have to pause for a while and actually spend the money. Because many people make money and never, you know, never get the chance to actually spend it. I, have this, I know this guy who owns $40 billion, uh, owns a bank. Uh, he still, he decided to retire at 85 when all his bodily functions are not, no longer working. What's this $40 billion for? So when you make money, remember, money is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Yeah? So you make money, pause a while, and learn to spend the money. Yeah? And then you think that having money, you'll be happy. But actually, this thing in human beings, huh? uh, this thing called desire, yeah? will cause you to be eternally unsatisfied. You think that you have money and happiness, you'll be tranquil, but this desire in you will always drive you to make you unhappy. If you are a python, you, know, you, you swallow a goat and you are full, and then you go to sleep. And then when you're hungry, you wake up, and you look for another python. You know? But if you are a, uh, you are a politician, you, know, you, you get one billion, you, know, you want two billion. You get two billion, you want ten. You know? So you never will ever be happy. Yeah? So man can never be satiated. Remember that. If you can control your satiation, uh, so basically, if you want to be happy, you have to control your desire. And the thing to do is to actually to, to, uh, to understand the cycle of life. Huh? You're born, uh, be aware that the moment you're born, you will start to die. And uh, the average lifespan is 76. And in your life, you pass through a number of phases. Yeah? And then you have the work phase. Uh, remember, in your work phase, don't work until you die. Uh, think of retirement, prepare for retirement. And that will be the time when you can actually enjoy a bit of life. And then your quest for wealth, your quest for happiness, and the search for tranquility will always be uh, you know, uh, determined by how bad is your desire. You know? And life is a series of phases. I told you just now what the phases are. You can expect some of the, some of the um, characteristics, understand them, uh, be prepared for them. And then there is your inner self that you have to control uh, against the outer world. Uh, which constrains you in your unfettered behavior. Uh, desire, uh, the trick, the real secret of happiness is not actually to seek more, but actually to learn, to, to enjoy whatever little that you have. Yeah? That, by the way, is uh, from Socrates. Okay, I will stop there. Basically, I have the last two H's, only three, two minutes more. What is the two H? Very simple. You all know quadratic equations? Okay, so let's say 2H is called HH and HS. What is HH and HS? Uh, life plus love is equal to happy, right? Life without love is sad, right? So if you put, you cancel love, you get two lives is equal to happy and sad, right? Now, life is equal to happy plus sad, divided by two. So life actually is half happy and half sad. Okay? That's your 2H. Right? <laughs> so, um, you can never have total satisfaction because human desire can never be satiated. You have only one life. Go out there and kick it. You know, it's a ball. You know? <laughs> okay? So I stop there. Thank you, Yusuf. Round of applause. All right. Um, and uh, Yusuf has some good photo and he wants to bring us to go and see the world. Can you spare five minutes for the photo? All right. Okay. I will show you some of the pictures I've shot. I've got two million pictures, actually. Over, <laughs> over the last 20 years, I've traveled through all the continents. And, uh, you know, my message to everybody is to live life. Uh, I'm a jet setter. Uh, photography is my passion. I'm not a photographer. Uh, I'm a gentleman of leisure. So uh, I'm trying to tell people that life is for living. You know, live. Don't just exist. Okay. And uh, you know, I, I go around shooting pictures and uh, in uh, <laughs> penguins in Antarctica. You know that there are no penguins in the North Pole. There are no polar bears in the South Pole. Okay. You learned something today. <laughs> 
And this is the kind of vehicle that I use to drive around the world. Yeah, that's the Sahara Desert. Our team was the first uh, Malaysians to drive across the Sahara Desert. We did it in about 30 days. Yeah, this is in the Atacama Desert of uh, South America. This is a Sahara Desert in uh, Algeria. I've driven from Cape Town to Cairo and from Cairo across the Sahara Desert to Casablanca. And then I've driven around South America from Buenos Aires to Buenos Aires. I've also driven uh, London to Malaysia a few times. We shipped the car to London and drive back. Yeah, the first uh, drive that I did was with the Patronos uh, adventure team from Istanbul to Kuala Lumpur. We came back and uh, I drove from uh, one weekend. Somebody said, hey, why don't we drive to India next week? I said, why not? Come. <laughs> so we did. Yeah. So I've been trying to ask PK, I'm going to Antarctica next week. Come. He says, no law, I must plan. <laughs> <laughs> so we just decided to go to India and next week we went to India and then uh, while, while there we said hey let's go and drive from London to Malaysia so okay takes a bit of planning ship the cars to London drove back through the north to Russia China Kazakhstan uh, and so on and then we came back and uh, while we were there we were saying hey why don't we go and drive around South America okay we did and then after that we said uh, We've gone northern route. Why don't we try the southern route? Okay, why not? Try the southern route. Yeah, you can sit there. And then after that, um, I got a bike, you know, and we drive all over the place, right from here to China and to uh, Indonesia, from, from uh, Jakarta, Aceh to, Aceh to uh, Bali, and from Bali to Manado. Yeah? So those are the routes that I've driven. Yeah? over the last 20 years. And uh, I want to show you some pictures. Uh, this was the, the ship that we chartered, a wooden ship to sail from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Iceland to Greenland and then from Greenland to the uh, North Pole. But we were stopped by ice for about 200, uh, 700 kilometers away. Yeah? And then um, in July, I'm going to Wrangel Island from uh, Anadir through the Bering Strait into the Chutkoka Peninsula um, to go and look at polar bears. Okay, and uh, next week I'll be going to Antarctica and this is the route that we'll be taking. We will leave from Ushawia, yeah, and um, sail to Antarctica and then from Antarctica we go through the Falklands and come back. Uh, so now I want to show you some of the pictures from all the strips. Uh, that's the ship that I used to cross uh, uh, the, the uh, Drake's Passage to go to Antarctica. And uh, the Drake's Passage is the world's most vicious sea. The waves are about 40 meters high, 20 to 40 meters. Yeah? So that's what it looks like. And uh, this is the ship that uh, PK and I uh, chartered with about 20 people to go and sail towards the North Pole. We stopped about 800 kilometers from the North Pole. And some of the, some of the sites that we saw that's in our minds. Uh, this is the Monaco brand uh, glacier. We parked the ship just there. This was the ship that I used for 11 people to sail to uh, Greenland. That's um, the view of the uh, ship from on top, you know, looking down at the sail. Okay. How beautiful does it look? i show you some polar ice capes. Yeah. This is Antarctica, the last frontier, the seventh continent. Yeah. Uh, from about 1900, when Antarctica became, uh, was discovered, less than 400,000 people out of the 8 billion people in the world has ever been to Antarctica. So if you go to Antarctica, it is special. Okay. So i show you some of the pictures. Icebergs. Uh, you get into this uh, zodiac, uh, PK will remember, and we will go and explore all these icebergs. And uh, the ice on the beach looks like diamonds. Okay, uh, this is Iceland. The Aurora Borealis in Iceland and Greenland. Yeah, this drinking 30,000 year iceberg melt. They say that if you drink iceberg melt, you are condemned to return again and again 
to Antarctica. That's why I've been to Antarctica seven times. And that's what a nice book looks like. Uh, a view out of God's window. Uh, frozen waterfalls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a glacier. That's the ship that uh, I hired or chartered with about 11 people to also go to Greenland. And this is the Perito Moreno Glacier in Patagonia, one of the seven most beautiful places in the world that you must go and see before you die. Yeah. Now I'll show you a few pictures, uh, three, four minutes more, pictures of uh, wildlife in the polar areas, okay? Uh, penguins, yeah? The polar bear went and stole the eggs of these birds and they come around like a gang and go and attack the polar bear, you see? These are polar bears. Mm -hmm. And uh, they hunt seals and they need the floating ice because the seal will come and rest on the ice and they come from, from underwater and hunt, hunt them. Global warming um, causes all this uh, ice to melt and that's why there are less and less polar bears now. As at last uh, estimate, there are only 25,000 of polar bears left in the world. Uh, now you must remember this. In the United States and Canada, they shoot for sport 750 polar bears a year. Yeah. So at this rate of, uh, of depletion, polar bears will become extinct uh, in about 10 years' time. Okay. Um, for your, the benefit of you photographers, of you who want to become photographers, when you shoot pictures, don't just shoot from the top, you know, like when you shoot babies. You know, go below, you know, from the bottom up, the perspective is completely different. Okay, look, the camera is on the ground. Now, and, uh, reindeer likes to knock their horns you know, together, but we saw, PK and I saw something that will shock you, you know. One reindeer had this netting, fishing net discarded um, in his horn because when they, when they makan, the horn is down there. Then they lock horns and this is what happened. They get stuck together. They get stuck together and we call the Coast Guard from about 300 kilometers away to come and help. And when they came with the helicopter, we were just leaving the area. One of them died already because of, of, uh, of fatigue, you know, trying to get this thing out. Okay. Uh, these are king penguins. Yeah. Walrus. These are musk oxes. Okay. Uh, these are guanacos. They are kind of deer that you find in Patagonia. They are the stuff that, uh, the, uh, that the pumas hunt. Yeah. I'll show you a few more pictures of the wildlife of Africa. Yeah. Zebras, yeah. the eye of the zebra, baboons, yeah. this is a crown crane, one of the most beautiful birds from uh, Serengeti, uh, lions doing what they do best, <laughs> cheetah, hippos, elephants, rhinos, And uh, every year, in about, uh, around about August, uh, two million wildebeest will cross the Mara River and the Nile crocodiles will be waiting for them there and they will eat this, this uh, attack this wildebeest and kill them. And that's a uh, scene of what it is like. If you want to see this, go in August. Uh, this is a two-humped camel in the uh, Taklimakan Desert near in Xinjiang Uyghur. Do you know the difference between the single hump camel and the twin hump camel? Well, one has two humps, one has one. <laughs> well, you find the two humps camel only in the Asian part of the, of the desert and the single hump is more in the um, Sahara uh, area. Yeah? Uh, a few pictures of the peoples of the world just to emphasize uh, Anas' uh, contention that um, the same blood Red color blood runs in every one of you, yeah? Um, your skin may be different. The gods you worship may be different. Your language may be different. But all of us, all of us, everybody have got the same wants and needs. We want safety. We want food. And then once we have safety and food, we want a bit of, um, 
uh, warm clothing, a nice house. Then we want to raise our family in a peaceful place. And we want uh, um, health and happiness. Yeah? This is common to every human being. And the blood in any human being can be, can be used to save your life. It doesn't matter whether that human being is an Indian or a Chinese or a Negro. Yeah? So why is it that everybody says that I'm different? That I have more right to be in this country than you? Yeah? Why? It's all upbringing, yeah? All upbringing. The brainwashing that you receive when you're in your, in your adolescence have uh, made you into the kind of animal that you are to hate the other guy. So we are here trying to tell you that everybody else is the same. Now look at all the different peoples. Now, all these people are just like you, you know. They, they, they have needs and wants. Uh, they need love. They need happiness. They worship different gods. They do very, very strange things. They wear lip uh, plates in their lips. Uh, by the way, the bigger the plate in your lip, the higher your dowry is. So, plate the size, uh, you will need 30 cows to marry her plus one AK-47, that rifle. Yeah. Okay. Okay. See them? Okay, this is something that's quite unique. Yeah. Look at what she's doing. <laughs> what do you think she's doing? You see, they have discovered, they have discovered that when a cow has a calf, the cow naturally restricts the flow of milk, you know? That when you milk a cow with a calf, you, will, well, you, you tend to get about half a pail of milk, when normally you can get maybe three quarters to one full plate. So they found that by doing this, you know, by blowing into the vagina of the cow and, um, and uh, caressing the udder, and then they milk the cow after that, you get back the full pail of milk. And this is something scientific, you know, because in Australia, they use, uh, they don't use Australian women. <laughs> they use compressed air. Yeah? So it's a technique that uh, originated from Africa to induce the cow to give more milk. And you, when you travel, this is what you see, is it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, they, over here, if you don't wear the tudong and all that, you're supposed to be, you know, immoral. But over there, you know, you, they walk around stuck naked, you know, because it's hot. I come there with my baju and my hat and all that. You know who is the strange one? Me. I'm the strange one because I come to, the, to their country and they're all naked and I'm dressed. I'm strange. Yeah? So, perception, your point of view determines what you think of the other guy, you know? If you are there, you think they are strange, but they think you are a stranger. Right? So, perception. This is a couple, uh, a mother and a child from Vietnam, uh, also from Vietnam. This is uh, two uh, people from Ethiopia. On the right is a lady, I'm just finishing, uh, putting on their paint in their rites of passage. When they become an adult and they want to choose a girl to marry, they have to jump naked over 12 cows and their female relatives will subject themselves to being whipped, you know? And they taunt professional whippers to whip them, uh, and they don't scream. Uh, just to prove to the uh, bride that's taking their brother that they are prepared to sacrifice everything to show their love. So, strange, strange um, uh, customs, but that's what it is around the world, huh? uh, This is an uh, Orthodox Christian in uh, Lalibela. Uh, Ethiopia is where coffee first uh, was found. You can only find naturally growing coffee in Ethiopia. Uh, this is a coffee lady. Cuba. That's Cuba. Uh, that's in uh, Kathmandu, I think. Yes, it was. And this is a Dalo Volcano. Uh, this is Ertale Volcano in uh, the Danakil Depression. The cruelest place in the world. You can only climb this volcano at night uh, when the temperature drops down to about 49 degrees Celsius. Daytime is about 55. <laughs> that's the Danakil Hilton where we stay. And that's uh, Mount Bromo in Java. Uh, that's the uh, Torres del Paine in Patagonia, one of the seven most beautiful places in the world. And that's Tuscany. So you see the world is so pretty. Go out there and enjoy it. Why do you work till you die? That's our movable uh, uh, 
hotel. We have this tent on top of our cars and we drive. See how beautiful it is, walking on the crest of a barkan. You know what is a barkan? It's a, when the wind blows on the sand dunes, you know, it forms a kind of a crescent. You walk on that. Come on, Bo. Well, that's it. <laughs>